What you're about to hear is the second part of Anatomy of a Disaster, a two-part series on the USS Indianapolis. If you haven't listened to the first part, I would strongly encourage you to do so as it lays the groundwork for what we're about to discuss today. If you've listened to part one already and you're simply interested to hear what happened after the sinking, then this is Anatomy of a Disaster, Lost at Sea. Your arms and legs spasm and jerks as you wake. You look around wildly, unsure if you're still in the nightmare you just swam up from. At first, you can't see anything except for muted white light. Then as you bring your hands up to your face, you touch your makeshift blindfold and remember that you're in a nightmare, far worse than whatever you were dreaming of. The bright sky and sun shimmer and glare off the endless, wavy landscape blinding you. The only thing protecting your eyes out here is the torn shirt tied around your head. A lot of the other guys are wearing them as well, to block out as much of the sun as possible. Carefully, you reach your arms out to either side of you, feeling for the other men your life vest is tied to. You touch a man's face and hear his reply. What? Sorry. You croak back and gather yourself. You're part of a misshapen ring of twelve other men and a cluster of several other rings that make up your group. It's best to stay tied together, not only because you can't see, but also because it's easy to get separated in the high swells of the Pacific. There are other reasons to stay lashed to one another. To keep warm at night, for instance. Out here, near the equator, the waters are very warm. Around 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day, and somewhere in the mid-80s by night. Still, the human body's core temperature is supposed to be in the high 90s. So at night, you and the other survivors will inevitably begin to experience the symptoms of hypothermia. Since the Indianapolis sank, you and the others have barely slept at all from the shivering in your group. It's gotten so bad that when one guy has to take a leak, he announces it to the group so you can all gather around him for a few moments of warmth. But even when the waters warm back up during the day, you stay together. Because that's when the sharks come. For the last two days, you've been caught in a hellish cycle. As dawn breaks, the sharks descend upon you in groups. Tigers, between five and eight feet long, group up to kill and maim whoever looks vulnerable. And when their butchery ends, they spend the rest of the day cruising and eating whatever's left over from the morning slaughter. Then at dusk, they do it all over again. In boot camp, they didn't tell you much about sharks, just that you should thrash and kick when they got close. So that's what you do. When one guy in your ring begins to yell, you scream and splash as much as you can. Sometimes that makes them swim off, but sometimes it doesn't. Something bumps your chest and your arms shoot out in front of you. Who is it? You rasp. You feel the shape in front of you and realize it's another guy floating on his own. You feel for his head to make sure he isn't face down. You've run into other guys who told you about wounded buddies who would just lean forward and try to drown. This guy's head is out of the water, but he isn't saying anything. Probably dead already, you think. The waves keep you bobbing up and down constantly, and every hour it feels like your face is getting splashed a little bit more. You moan softly and roll your head back, your scalp dunking into the water. The life vests are rated for 48 hours of buoyancy, but now, nearly 60 hours after you hit the ocean, they're significantly waterlogged. You and the other guys are barely keeping your chins above the water, and soon you know you'll be dog battling to do even that. The vest straps are painful around your chest and armpits, as they rub your skin raw, causing it to bleed intermittently. The doc calls them saltwater burns, and luckily for you, yours are only about the size of dimes. Other guys have got them all over, some as big as baseballs. Your sunburned face is caked with sweat and salt, leaving it dry and cracked. It is painful and useless to look at your parched lips. Your mouth and throat are as dry as desert sands. You don't speak unless you absolutely have to, and when you do, you don't recognize the voice that comes out. When you close your eyes, you try to satisfy your thirst the only way you can, imagining yourself drinking glass after glass of sparkling ice-cold water. That's what you're thinking about when you feel the first bump, soft but deliberate against your right calf. You almost convince yourself it was a fluke when it happens again. The sandpaper skin of the shark rubs against your wounded leg. 
You can't see it below the surface, but you know it's drawn blood. Shark! You rasp out, before collecting yourself and trying again. Shark! Soon all of the men in your group are kicking and shouting shark right alongside you. This goes on for about a minute when you hear something in front of you faintly splash. The sound is so subtle you wonder if you heard anything at all. You slowly reach up and pull the shirt from your eyes to your forehead. Light stabs at your eyes and it takes several long seconds before you can make out anything. As your vision returns you see a nightmarish field of debris between you and the other groups. There's all kinds of miscellaneous items floating around you. Hats, empty boxes, items that are completely useless to your survival. But there are also remains floating by. The remains of that morning's attack. Limbs that end abruptly. Fractions of your fellow men. Ragged, bloody strips of cloth that may have been somebody's shirt or pants. And of course there are the killers themselves. Dozens of dorsal fins cut through the water. And in the clear water below you, you see dozens more. Suddenly a shape bursts through the water in front of you, and you scream as you brace for the shark's teeth. But no bite comes. Instead, the shape just floats a few inches from you. With a shaking hand, you reach out and pull it to you. You feel the canvas and realize it's a life vest. Knots tied tight like somebody should be in it. It's only then that you realize you don't see the guy that bumped into you. As we now turn to discuss the survival of these men, as well as the unimaginable trials they suffered while fighting for that survival, it's important to build a cohesive narrative. Doug Sand presents the story of the survivors by looking at the leaders of these groups, and I would like to do that here by focusing on three main groups. To begin, I'll start with the smallest, which was led by Captain McVeigh. Charles Butler McVeigh III, came from a military family. Both his father and grandfather were Navy men. His father was actually an admiral in the Navy, and not just an admiral. He'd also been the commander-in-chief of the Asiatic Fleet for a time in the 1930s. This story's McVeigh graduated in 1920 from the Naval Academy in Annapolis, Maryland, knowing that he had a certain legacy to live up to. And in the Second World War, he did his best to live up to that legacy. He earned a silver star during the Battle of the Solomon Islands in 1943 and went on to serve as the chairman of the Joint Intelligence Committee of the Combined Chiefs of Staff, which put him in one of the highest intelligence units during the war. He took command of the Indianapolis in November of 1944 and went on to lead it through the vicious fighting mentioned earlier in Okinawa. After he made it off the ship, he floated alone for several minutes unable to see or hear anyone else. Briefly, he thought that perhaps this was his punishment for letting the ship go down. But not too long after, he heard men calling out, and he saw two life rafts approaching him. These rafts had been amongst the lucky few to have been properly outfitted, both with food supplies that included several pounds of Spam, numerous malted milk tablets, cans of crackers, as well as survival kits that included first aid supplies, a flare gun, and fishing kits. After assessing the supplies, he estimated that there were enough rations to keep him and the nine other men alive for about ten days. Ever a captain, he maintained discipline by keeping the men busy, giving them their own duties, and speaking with a confidence that gave them all reason to hope. The second group we're going to focus on was the biggest. It was comprised of some 400-odd men who had jumped to port, that is the left side of the ship. I'll be referring to this group as the Haynes Group, but initially it was led by Captain Park, who was amongst the ship's marine detachment, as well as the ship's chaplain, Father Conway, and the ship's doctor, Louis Haynes. Like Captain McVeigh, Haynes had been awoken by being thrown out of bed by the explosion of the first torpedo. He had barely gotten to his feet when the second one knocked him back down. While making his way above deck, he had been caught in a flash fire, giving him third-degree burns on his hands as well as his forehead. 
Once he managed to make his way to sick bay, he encountered dozens of men with broken limbs and burned so bad that he described their skin as hanging in melted flaps which fluttered in the wind. He immediately set about the task of administering as much morphine as possible, but very quickly he realized that the ship was going down. Once his patients began to slide down the deck, he made it a point to tie vest onto those that could not tie them on themselves. He enlisted as many men as he could in this process. Eventually, however, the list became so pronounced that he knew that he would have to abandon ship or become a casualty himself. Jumping from the keel, he swam into the throngs of men that had jumped to port. This group was clustered around a life ring, which was attached to 200 or so feet of the ship's line. In the middle of that ring was Captain Park, who was directing the survivors to move the most badly wounded to the middle of the ring to better keep them afloat. Sitting with Captain Park in the middle of this ring, he heard in the darkness men moaning and crying, Doctor, for their buddies. He hesitated, knowing that without any medical equipment, there was little, if anything, he could do for any of them. Finally, though, his conscience got the better of him, and he swam after the ship's chaplain, Father Conway, who was going about giving last rites. He did what little he could for them, and to those that he could not, Father Conway gave last rites. The final group was led by Ensign Harlan Twybel and Chief Engineer Richard Redmayne. Now, an ensign is the lowest caliber of officer in the Navy, and Twybel was barely an ensign, having been one of those that were only two weeks out of Annapolis. That night he'd actually been in the crow's nest when the torpedoes hit, but since the power was dead, there was nothing he could do to communicate with the bridge. Redmayne was badly burned, having third-degree burns on his hands and face, and so most of the responsibility would fall to Twybel. This group was comprised of about 325 men, and they had been lucky enough to disembark on the starboard side, where most of the life-saving equipment had fallen over deck. Amongst them were five floater nets, four rafts, and a smattering of random supplies that included malted milk tablets, biscuit tins, and a few beakers of fresh water. As the night wore on, four out of five of those nets were loaded with the wounded, while the fifth acted as a kind of rest station for the healthy, for those that were helping those without life jackets to stay afloat. Now, each of these three groups were separated by roughly a mile, with smaller groups in between. In all, they were spread along a nearly three-mile-long line that was lengthening and widening every minute. Initially, none of these groups knew for certain that the others existed, but as time went on, men would be thrown out of their cluster by the 15-foot swells and then united to another. All of them were moving roughly west at about an average of a mile an hour, and their drift was affected by something called the leeway effect. It's a phenomena that involves the relationship between exposed body surface, ocean current, and wind. As a result, those in rafts and on nets would have blown farther to the north, while swimmers would have blown farther to the south. And so the big picture of what this looks like is that the survivors with the Twible group were blowing farther to the north, the Haynes group was blowing farther south, and the groups with rafts, like Captain McVeigh's, were somewhere in the middle. And all the survivors looked like a giant teardrop with the tip part pointing to the southwest. As Doug Stanton puts it, they were now floating in a southwesterly course, headed in the general direction of Borneo rather than toward the ship's intended direction of Lady, which lay 650 miles ahead, nearly due west. Behind them, another 650 miles due east lay Guam, their previous port of call. They were drifting through the dead middle of no man's land, a pocket of ocean that spanned some 10,000 square miles. As dawn broke over the survivors on that first day, Monday, July the 30th, many of the mortally wounded had already died. When Dr. Haynes had abandoned ship, he had done so without any medicine. So truly, there was little else that he could do aside from assess the men's condition and to try to offer words of hope to them. A number of these men didn't even have life jackets. And most of the men with the life jackets did their best to hold those up without them. There were some that went an entire day just holding them, kicking, keeping their head above the water. Each time a man was given his last rites by Father Conway, 
there would be several men swimming about waiting to take the jacket off the dead. And as they were buried at sea, the most injured would be given the best. To complicate the issue, the same oil which was eating away at the men's skin was also eating away at the seams of the life belts, making some of them worthless. Ever the physician, Dr. Haynes kept himself busy diagnosing the men that he came across. In the back of his mind, he knew that someone in good health, a strong, healthy 19-year-old, could live for maybe 30 days without food, maybe as many as 7 days without water. But at the same time, he knew that the most weakened and wounded amongst them would be dead in a matter of hours, and perhaps the luckiest amongst them had perhaps a day or two. Even the healthy began to experience health problems on this first afternoon. As the men would inhale the salt spray coming in off the swells, it would begin something called a plasma shift within their lungs. What a plasma shift does is it causes the lungs to slowly fill with fluid, the accumulation of which would cause what's called a pulmonary edemia. As an edemia sets into the lungs, it causes a difficulty in breathing which in turn lowers the oxygen content in your bloodstream and finally will result in irregular heartbeats. This is what dozens of the men were experiencing as they kicked and dog paddled their way to keeping their head above the water. But a more widespread condition was the onset stages of photophobia. Photophobia literally means fear of light, but what it really refers to is a sensitivity to light. If you've ever been to the ocean or a great body of water on a bright, cloudless day, then you know how bright the light can reflect off the water. Imagine experiencing that at eye level, constantly, without any sunglasses. Your eyes would burn with stabbing pangs when they were open, and even when you closed them, you could still see light coming in through your eyelids. To try to combat this, the men began to make makeshift blindfolds, tearing their shirts apart, tearing apart any garments they could find, to try to cut down on the light as much as they could, making their way around by splashing and calling out to one another. Meanwhile, in Captain McVeigh's group, the men began to realize that the same oil that was burning their skin also acted as a kind of sunscreen, and McVeigh figured that this burning had to be better than getting sun poisoning. So he ordered the men with oil to spread it over their naked flesh. As the afternoon drew on, the men saw two planes taking off probably from Tinian or one of the surrounding islands towards the front at Okinawa. As they passed over, men would try to flash them with mirrors. They would try splashing around, but try as they might, uh, nobody saw them. And McVeigh understood this, and he explained calmly to them that a pilot wasn't going to see anything that he wasn't looking for because he is too busy flying the plane. And at 3,000 feet, that is, you know, especially true looking out over the ocean. As I mentioned before, the rafts in McVeigh's group happened to be some of the ones that were actually properly outfitted with survival supplies. So looking over the pounds of spam and crackers, McVeigh figured that the 10 of them could probably survive for about 10 days. One thing they were, however, low on was water, and there was a moment when they were floating amongst the debris when a water beaker floated by and McVeigh picked it up. When he put it to his lips, he realized straight off that the water had gone over. It was brackish, it was completely undrinkable. But to try to preserve hope, he swallowed it and told the men that it tasted fine, but they were going to hold on to it until they really needed it, and he prayed that they would not really need it. A smattering of food supplies had managed to fall overboard on the starboard side where the tribal group was. However, this was not rationed. Men did their best to conceal what little they could in their clothing and tried to slake their thirst with malted milk tablets. I don't know if you've ever tried to put powdered condensed milk in your mouth, but it doesn't slake your thirst. In fact, by most accounts, it left the men who did it miserable. As they went on, hopes were pretty high amongst the men because they knew that if a distress signal hadn't been sent off the ship, then by the next evening, Tuesday, July 31st, just one more day, and we'll be rescued. However, what the men didn't know was that in addition to the 
dehydration, the edemias, the photophobia. There was another threat closing in on them. By dusk of Monday evening, some of the men began to feel nudges at their feet, nudges at their waist. And there, somewhere in the darkness, hundreds of sharks were encircling the survivors. It is the habit of sharks to trail seagoing vessels and to eat the refuse thrown overboard. Think about that the next time you're on a cruise ship. The Indianapolis was emitting a low-grade electrical current into the water, which was probably stimulating and attracting the sharks following behind it. It should be said that sharks do not prefer people to their usual diet of fish. However, they are opportunistic eaters, and they have been found to eat a wide variety of animals. As late Monday night and early Tuesday morning began to wear on, some of the men asleep would begin to bob underwater and just not come back up, not even their life vests. Some of the men would feel bumps. They would wonder who was there, who was nudging them. The sharks really began to attack around dawn, Tuesday morning. At first they went for those who were not moving, the wounded, the sleepers. But next they began to go for the lone swimmers. You see, sharks hone in on color contrast, so those less clothed were more vulnerable to attack. Some of the men at first thought that they were patrol boats coming their way, and they braced themselves either for a confrontation with the Japanese or, more heartbreakingly, for rescue. It was only as they realized that these shapes were not producing wakes that they realized they were sharks cruising towards them. In boot camp, the men were taught that they should thrash around when they saw a shark. They should try to frighten it off by kicking and screaming at it. Present-day wisdom holds, however, that one should lie perfectly still if they see a shark, as they are often agitated by sudden movement. At this time, the Navy discouraged talk about sharks, fearing that it would hurt morale. But they were thinking about it. By 1943, the Navy had developed a kind of shark repellent kit that could be attached to life vests. This kit consisted of a packet filled with black dye, and in that dye was decomposing shark flesh and ammonium acetate. The idea was for a man to rip this packet open, spread it in the water, which would create a kind of plume that was supposed to shield from a shark attack. It was a novel concept, but none of the life vests aboard the Indianapolis had any of these packets. Gradually, these sharks moved from picking off the sleepers to lone swimmers to eventually attacking entire groups. I'm going to quote from a passage in Harm's Way about the attacks. Stanton writes, As the water flashed with twisting tails and dorsal fins, the boys resolved to stay calm, clamping their hands over their ears against the erupting screams. But this resolve vanished when one of the boys was dragged through the water like a fisherman's bobber tugged by a big catfish. The victim, clenched in the upper jaws of a shark, was pushed at waist level through the surf, screaming. Others disappeared quietly without a trace, their vests shooting back to the surface empty, the straps in shreds. As the excited sharks grew more agitated, their attacks intensified in ferocity. Capable of bursts of speed of up to 43 miles an hour, they were attacking using what is known as bump and bite maneuvers. The way bump and bite works for sharks is that they will first bump into the prey, testing their resistance. When they feel like they have a good idea of it, they will bump into them at full force and attempt to stun them before grabbing them in their jaws. Now, if a shark is able to get a hold of one of your limbs you're not going to get it back out. The bite of a tiger shark, which was the primary shark attacking the men, has been measured to be 15 tons per square inch. When its jaws clamped down on a man's arm, it would jerk its head side to side, shredding the muscle, all without ever letting go of the bone. Unless you were able to jam your thumb in its eye, which is what some of the men did, a tiger shark is not letting go. Even those in rafts were not safe from the sharks. Survivor Giles McCoy, who was part of the marine detachment on the ship, recalled how his boat had a hole in it, and the only thing separating the men on board from the seawater was a mesh grate. 
Apparently, sharks would swim up into this hole, sticking their noses in and attempting to bite anyone that they could. At first, McCoy considered shooting the shark as he had made it off the ship with his Colt 45 sidearm, but realized it would be useless as he gazed out upon the dozens of sharks encircling them. Instead, when a shark would emerge through the hole, the men would kick at it till eventually they would hit its eyes, making it swim away in great spasms, only for another one to appear minutes later. This became a pattern as the sharks would attack them in at daybreak, killing who they would, and then cruising around, eating the dead and wounded during the day, before attacking once again at night. As the sharks would swim through the men, their rough skin would rub raw at the legs of the men already agitated by the oil. According to some accounts, this attracted smaller fish and even barracuda that would come to nibble away at the flesh. As the survivors of Tuesday morning shark attack swam on through the day, some of them began to lose the will to live. Many of these still injured with head injuries or broken limbs were beginning to go into shock and drowning as a result. Even those without injuries were beginning to drown through suicide. There are numerous accounts from survivors of seeing a man take off his life vest, taking a single stroke forward and simply disappearing into the water. Still others reported some of the boys giving money or maybe mementos that they wish to be sent home, before swimming off into the bright horizon never to be seen again. Others who were too wounded or otherwise incapacitated to swim would simply put their faces straight down in the water. Sometimes a buddy would swim over, pull the man up by his hair, and scream at him to hold on. The rescue was coming, it was just another day away that he just had to hold on, only for him to put his head back down in the water as soon as he let go. Even those in the life rafts began to commit suicide. In Private McCoy's original group of 17, there were only 12 by Tuesday evening, five of which had quietly slipped over the edge when no one was looking, never to be seen again. By dusk of Tuesday evening, the men had been without water, sleep, or shelter for over 40 hours. Of the nearly 1,200 crewmen who had left Guam three days earlier, no more than 600 were still alive. In the previous 24 hours alone, at least 200 had succumbed to either drowning or shark attack. As the day wore on, a growing minority of men were beginning to drink the salt water. This came to the horror of many men, but most especially to Dr. Haynes. To once again quote from In Harm's Way, Seawater contains twice the salinity that the human body can safely consume. By drinking the water, the men's cells began to shrink. They would shrink, expand, and eventually explode, sacrificing the fresh water within them in an attempt to lower the sodium in their bloodstream. It was a futile effort, however, as their kidneys were unable to keep ahead of the tidal waves of sodium. They began to experience hypernatremia, the condition left them with root beer colored substances dripping down their chins as their eyes would begin to roll back into their heads. In their brains, neurons began misfiring or ceased to fire entirely. It was an endless loop of self destruction that could only be remedied by massive hydration. Their throats became too dry to scream. Those who succumbed fell into violent fits, whooping and splashing around in the water before finally falling into a coma. This often took no more than two hours. As Tuesday evening wore on, the men began to face yet another problem. The life vest they were wearing had a certified buoyancy of 48 hours. And now, more than 40 hours on, most of the men were up to their chins in water. By Tuesday evening, the men still alive had yet another problem. Many of the group leaders ordered the men to tie their vests together, both to form a protective group from the sharks, as well as to keep warm at night. They were so cold by Tuesday night that the men began to announce when they had to take a leak so that others could feel just a few moments' warmth when they did so. One man reported that his teeth chattered so badly that he put a rope between them only to chew through it by Wednesday morning. In addition to the pneumonia, and pulmonary edemia many of the men were beginning to experience. Almost all of them were, by Tuesday evening, experiencing hypothermia. 
Being in such close proximity to the equator, the ocean the men were swimming in was quite warm, averaging around 100 degrees Fahrenheit during the day. But at night, the temperature would drop to around 85, about 10 degrees cooler than the body's core temperature. Hypothermia would affect each man differently, depending on his body size as well as how much clothing he had on. But on average, most of the men were losing about a degree an hour. As dusk would give way into night, they would begin to experience uncontrollable shivering. This is your body's way of maintaining heat, but it quadruples the rate at which oxygen is consumed. Once your core temperature gets down to around 93 degrees, it tries to conserve energy by depressing your central nervous system. You will start to become apathetic. You'll have a hard time speaking. In some cases, you'll begin to experience amnesia. Once your temperature drops to 91, your kidneys will stop working. This causes hypoxia, or poisoning, from your waist. Once your temperature drops to 91 degrees, your kidneys will stop working, causing hypoxia, or poisoning, from your waist. By dawn, most of the men's temperatures were hovering somewhere around the mid to high 80s and would rise somewhere between 5 to 7 degrees during the day before dropping again during the night. Essentially, their bodies were caught in a ferocious pattern of abrupt energy drain, followed by renewal, but with the deficit growing every day. Imagine experiencing this agony not just for a night, but for four days and nights in a row. Imagine not only the mindset that this would put you in, but imagine what this might lead you to do. By Tuesday evening, the ship was now several hours late. The question is, did Leyte notice the Indianapolis's absence as every survivor was now praying for? Before discussing the events of that evening, let's talk about how shipping dispatches worked at this point during the war. At the beginning of the conflict, ports would transmit shipping dispatches of all vessels departing and arriving. When a ship did not arrive in port at its intended time, radio men around the region would attempt to make contact and report the absence of the chain of command. Whichever base commander had jurisdiction over that particular swath of sea would then direct appropriate vessels to respond with a rescue effort. As the war went on, America's reach across the Pacific grew, and with it the tangle of relay stations. Combined with the sheer amount of America's Pacific bases and ships was the ongoing power struggle between the Army and Navy. Orders relayed to one branch may not get shared with the other. In order to cut down on the daily mountains of shipping dispatches, Naval Directive 10CL-45 was issued in January of 1945. 10CL-45 instructed henceforth the, quote, Arrival of combat ships shall not be reported, unquote. Now, by Tuesday evening, both the command that the Indianapolis had sailed from and the one that it was due to arrive to thought that it had completed its voyage. Most of the tracking officers in Lady were fairly new to the job, and they reported the ship as having arrived because they assumed that all combat ships arrived at their destinations unless they received notice otherwise. The one experienced tracking officer, Lieutenant Stuart Gibson, noticed that the Indianapolis was in fact not at the base and should not have been marked as arrived. But instead of reporting its absence, he amended its status to overdue. He did this because he further interpreted Directive 10CL45 that the arrival of combat ships shall not be reported to also mean that the non-arrival of combat ships shall not be reported. Because combatant ships like the Indianapolis did not fall under the jurisdiction of port directors, he assumed that the Indianapolis had been given new orders and likely diverted to another destination. At the same time, Rear Admiral McCormick, to whom the Indy was supposed to sail with from Leyte, also assumed that the Indianapolis had changed course. All the while, Vice Admiral Oldendorf, to whom the Indy was to report to, had no reason to be concerned, as he still did not know her ETA. By the dawn of Wednesday, August 1st, the onset of hypothermia, 
dehydration, hypernatremia, photophobia, starvation, and the myriad of other conditions had begun to turn the men's minds inside out. Just before light broke over the ocean, dozens of men in Dr. Haynes' group began to hallucinate at the same time. It apparently began with one man screaming, A Jap! We've got a Jap here! before stabbing another guy. All at once, the men began to untie their life vest and kick away, stabbing, punching, and gouging at everybody around him. There are some truly appalling accounts of the violence, with men who had known one another for months or even years, violently trying to kill one another. There's a story of one sailor merely being stabbed by another man, only to be rescued by two other sailors having to hold the stabber underwater. They apparently cried in anguish as they drowned him before immediately turning and attacking one another. Dr. Haynes himself was jumped by a man with a knife and had to fight to hold him underwater until he was able to kick off and swim away from the chaos of which the sharks were now joining in. It's impossible to know with any certainty, but from piecing together survivors' accounts, it's been estimated that as many as 50 men in the Haynes group may have been killed in 10 minutes. As the day wore on, tensions remained high amongst other groups as well. On the group of rafts that Marine Private McCoy was on, an argument resulted in someone pulling out a pistol. They all mutually agreed to cut their respective rafts loose from one another, and after drifting for some distance, someone on McCoy's raft thought that he was holding out water on them and pulled a knife. McCoy in turn drew his pistol and forced everyone to throw their knives overboard before tossing his gun over the side and watching it sink amongst the hundreds of jellyfish now surrounding the raft. By Wednesday morning, the survivors had been afloat for 55 hours, and most of the men began to believe that no one was coming to their rescue. At this point, there were about 450 men still alive, losing an average of one man every 10 minutes. The salt water was beginning to really affect the men's bodies. The most common ailment came in the way of saltwater burns, which is like a severe irritation of the skin. They could be as small as dimes or apparently as large as basketballs. It was even beginning to make some of the men's hair fall out. Most of the men's body temperatures were hovering somewhere in the high 80s, leaving a lot of them close to comas. Those who weren't in comas were beginning to experience arrhythmias and the effects of their kidney shutting down. As the day wore on, the men began to hallucinate in mass, seeing visions of islands, grocery stores. Some men saw wives, their girlfriends. It wasn't uncommon to see some of the boys trying to start up invisible automobiles or motorboats to sail away on. A lot of the men were even seeing the same hallucination. Dr. Haynes reported seeing about a dozen men in single file, and when he swam up to one of them to ask what they were waiting on, one of the men in line told him that there was a motel pointing off in the distance and that you could pay to get five minutes of sleep in a bed. Another group was lined up single file, and when he swam to them, they told him, very matter-of-factly, that they were about to swim the 660-odd miles to Lady to send help back. They figured they could make the trip in about two days. None of the men made it more than 200 yards before either drowning or succumbing to shark attack. Meanwhile, in the Twible group, order began to break down. This came as Chief Engineer Redmayne had given in to the temptation to drink salt water and began to hallucinate. He told Twible that he was going to swim down to the Indianapolis and restart her engine so they could sail out of there. To keep Redmayne from drowning himself, Twible gave him a shot of morphine and tied their vests together so that he could tow him. The hallucination of a still operational Indianapolis was apparently a pretty common one. Here I'll once more quote Doug Stanton. What struck Haynes was the grandest hallucination of all, however, was the moment about midday when the Indianapolis herself ghosted over the horizon and sailed back into the boys' lives. At times, they yelled the ship was steaming towards them. At others, it was drifting peacefully below them in clear green water, her flags flying smartly, her portholes relit and gleaming. Some of the boys dove down to the ship and began swimming through her long passageways, back to their bunks, to the mess halls, and to the water fountains where they drank deeply. 
I found it, they screamed in heartbreaking relief, breaking back to the surface. There's fresh water on board. Come on, fellas, let's go. She ain't sunk. More boys took deep breaths and dove to the ship, and in the aqua light of their dreams they sat at tables eating ice cream and drinking tall glasses of water. Don't drink! Don't do it! Haines shouted, his throat raw, his voice breaking as he watched their dreams turn to nightmares. In contrast to all this, there was little irrational behavior displayed amongst these survivors in Captain McVeigh's rafts. The one notable exception was a sailor who became fixated on the sharks circling the rafts. In a sudden fit, he stabbed one of them right between the eyes with a penknife, causing it to thrash violently and strike the raft with its tail. He was quickly subdued and his knife thrown overboard. But aside from this incident, McVeigh managed to keep the men calm. He passed the time by asking the men about their personal lives and even got personal himself, discussing his wife, Louise, back in Washington, D.C. By all accounts, the men really respected him for his candidness, and he was candid, speculating about his upcoming court-martial and what he would have to say to the families of the slain. He even told them at one point that he should have gone down with the ship, a point on which all of the men disagreed. More than at any battle he had been in, he now truly felt that he understood what it meant to be in harm's way. But nevertheless, he did everything he could to keep spirits high, telling the men that they would be rescued by the next day. By late afternoon, Haynes was left alone to lead his group. Captain Park had been working tirelessly to keep men and waterlogged vests afloat. He finally succumbed to his body's deficit, dying in mid-hallucination while swimming away for the horizon. It was a considerable blow to the morale of the men who were still lucid as was the death of the group's other pillar, Father Conway. He died in Dr. Haynes's arms, deliriously blessing him and singing in Latin. Left alone to look after the men, Haynes kept himself busy, attempting to help what men he could and burying the other ones that he could not. As the day wore on, he began to see himself more as a coroner than a doctor, as he buried more and more of the men at sea. He would swim up to a boy, unmoving, eyes closed, and asked them if they were alive. Those that responded through voice or by reflex were saved. Those who didn't, he put under, saying aloud, this man is dead. The men around him would eagerly reach for his waterlogged vest. Many of the men with vest had bleeding sores from the chafing, but would refuse to let go of their shipmates without one. Untying the vest was painful, methodical work for Haynes because of the oil on his fingers as well as the straps. When he got them off, he would wrap the dog tags of the dead around his arms. He would hold his cheek to theirs and recite the Lord's Prayer, sometimes making it to the end and sometimes not. He would then drop the men, watching them fall either until they disappeared or until they were eaten by a shark. For the rest of his life, Dr. Haynes would be unable to say the Lord's Prayer without weeping. By the late afternoon, Dr. Haynes had dozens of dog tags around his arms, rubbing them raw. Eventually, the pain became too much, and he had to shake them off, watching them disappear into the deep. At Lady, the Indianapolis was once again marked overdue, and the following day, an operations officer would mark it as arrived. Despite the ship's apparent absence in the harbor, Despite that little peculiarity, he requested to have her removed from the plotting board entirely, assuming, like Rear Admiral McCormick, that the Indy had simply been redirected somewhere else. Elsewhere on the island, Captain James Nolan was assembling the components of Little Boy, while the flight crews of the 509th Composite Group, led by Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tibbetts, were practicing secret dummy bombing runs over Japan. No one thought to miss the Indy. At 9 a.m. on Thursday, August the 12th, Lieutenant Chuck Gwynn and the crew of Gambler 17 lifted off the runway at Peleliu in the Marianas Islands. Like Guam and Tinian, Peleliu was a war-pocked island some 1,400 miles from the front. That morning, Gwynn's PV-1 patrol bomber had been outfitted with an experimental long-range antenna, which his crew was to test once they were out to sea. They were told in that morning's briefing that they would pass over the Petty Convoy route and may see a few cargo ships, but otherwise the coast should be clear. 
Once the plane reached its intended airspace, it cruised at an altitude of 3,000 feet. Quickly, the antenna gave the men problems, first as the sock around it began to fall off, and then as the antenna itself began to wildly whip against the side of the plane, making it completely inoperative. At 11 a.m., Gwen and his bombardier assessed the problem through the floor window and tried to think of a way to keep it from flying around. Gazing out the window, the men thought that they could see an oil slick below them. Thinking that it may be a Japanese sub, Gwen ordered depth charges loaded and guided the plane into a bombing run over the slick. Cruising over the spot at around 900 feet, Gwen began to realize that there were figures in the oil, looking up and waving at him. Seeing this, he decided to cancel the bombing run and instead took another pass, this time at 300 feet, whereupon he counted around 30 heads. Uncertain as to whether these were American or Japanese sailors, he decided to drop life rafts and other life-saving gear, just in case. At 11.25, he radioed Peleliu to report the sighting and to ask whether or not any Allied ships had been reported sunk in the area. This was the first report of the Indianapolis' sinking. Down in the water, the 100 men still alive in Haynes' group were ecstatic as Gambler 17 dropped orange dive bombs to mark their position. Operating on the faintest twinge of adrenaline, Dr. Haynes swam alongside the strongest men to the life-saving equipment. As others began piling onto rafts, Haynes searched for water. Knowing that they were likely to be in the water for several more hours, hydration became his primary concern. Unfortunately, however, the water beakers he found were empty, having burst upon impact when they dropped. Back in the air, Gwyn reported that he was now seeing more than 50 survivors and requested PBY floater planes, whose crews were specially trained to find survivors at sea. As those planes began taxiing down the runway, Sink Pack in Manila ordered all vessels to break radio silence and report their positions. Not long after this, Commodore Norman Gillette, the Commodore that had been busy playing bridge when the Indianapolis' distress signal came in, reported that the ship had not arrived. Command stations across the Philippine frontier checked their logs and realized that none of them had received a dispatch from the Indianapolis in days. As the Navy worked to put the pieces of this puzzle together, they launched the largest sea rescue in United States naval history. Around 2.30 p.m., Lieutenant Adrian Marks came and relieved Gambler 17, which was at this point nearly out of fuel, having circled the survivors for four hours. Marks began bombarding the men with food, water, and other life-saving equipment. Flying at just 25 feet over the water, he could see dozens of sharks swimming around the men. Sometime around 3 o'clock, he and his crew looked on with horror as a group of sharks tore apart a floater net, killing all the men on top of it. Knowing that the nearest rescue ships were still 12 hours away, he decided to put his Ventura bomber down amongst the men and rescue whoever he could. He was under strict orders not to make a sea landing, and in fact there was later talk of court-martialing him for doing so, but nevertheless he brought it down amongst the men of Haynes' group. He cruised through the water at about 32 miles an hour, with the crew raising and lowering the landing gear to act as a kind of brake. In the process, the airframe took three big blows from the waves and began to take on seawater. The crew did what they could to stop the leaks, stuffing pencils and cotton into the split seams, as they moved in an attempt to pick up as many of the remaining men before nightfall, before the next shark attack. When Haynes reached the plane, he immediately called out for a beaker of water and a life vest. He got the vest on and swam to a nearby raft. Once he was pulled aboard, he took a sip from the beaker and then began passing a cup around to the boys on board with him. And to their credit, each man waited his turn. The men had to wait minutes between each of these cups to keep from upsetting their shrunken stomachs. Most had two drinks, or about one cup, before passing out into a deep sleep broken only by requests for more water. Within only a few hours, the plane's water supply was completely gone. The men Marx's crew pulled aboard were in tremendous pain, with the skin of some of the boys remaining on the hands of the airmen pulling them aboard. Several of the men were still hallucinating, causing them to thrash, kick holes in the fuselage. One of the sailors pulled aboard remarked that it really must be raining like hell for there to be so much water in the plane. This stirred the men into frenzied bouts of bailing out water coming in through the seams of the plane. As the evening drew on, the men were bailing between 12 and 15 buckets of water an hour. Knowing that his plane was never going to take off again, Marx determined to make the best use of its space. 
By nightfall, his final tally was 56 survivors, with seven tied to the plane's wings with parachutes and rope to prevent them from falling off. At 11.45 p.m. that night, the destroyer Cecil J. Doyle was the first rescue vessel to steam into the debris field. The Doyle immediately launched whaleboats to begin ferrying men over from Marx's plane. Once all of the men were shuttled over, the crew of the aircraft watched as the Doyle's anti-aircraft gun sank their plane. An hour later, a high-speed transport, the Bassett, arrived, followed four hours later by two destroyers and a destroyer escort. During the pre-dawn hours, the Bass had picked up 152 survivors, the largest group to be rescued. These were the men of the Twible group, but between the Twible and Haines group, Captain McVeigh's rafts floated on through the night. At first, a number of the survivors suspected their rescuers to be Japanese and needed some coaxing from the other sailors. This feeling was evidently mutual amongst their saviors, as at this point it had yet to be confirmed whether or not it was an American ship that had sank. There is at least one account of a rescuer asking a group of oil-caked faces, pistol drawn, what city the Dodgers played for. He only holstered his weapon when one of them cried out, Brooklyn! Again, a number of these survivors were still actively hallucinating, which required the rescuers to get creative. One group was told that they were going to a dance and that they needed to form a conga line, and another group was told that they had to line up single file and climb up the rope ladder to be inspected before they got a night out on shore. Once the survivors were eventually pulled aboard, they were waited on hand and foot, even by the officers. Some of the men helping them aboard broke down and wept at the sight of the living corpses. All of that time spent in the salt water had made their skin pendulous, and it often tore easily as they were handled. Those that did not need immediate medical attention from shark bites, shock, or any of the other injuries that they may have received during the torpedoing were led to the shower rooms. Here they were sat in chairs and doused with kerosene to get some of the thick oil off their bodies. On average, a 19-year-old man, which was the average age of these men, carries around 20% body fat. Some of them had lost as much as 14%. Slowly, they were fed fruit one bite at a time and given water one spoonful at a time to avoid overwhelming their stomachs. Now, as fate would have it, the captain of the Cecil J. Doyle was one Graham Clater, who was, in fact, the cousin of Captain McVeigh's wife, Louise. In the 12 hours since Lieutenant Gwynn had reported the survivors, no one, aside from Lieutenant Marks's crew, knew that they were from the Indianapolis. Stunned to discover that he was rescuing his cousin-in-law's men, Clater radioed the Western Caroline Islands that he was rescuing the survivors of the Indianapolis. This sent shockwaves all the way up naval command to Admirals King and Nimitz, both of who feared that the tragedy would mar what would otherwise be the Navy's finest hour in the wake of the plans to bomb Japan. You see, the following day, the same day that the rest of the Indies survivors were being rescued, President Truman was sailing from London back to the United States after attending the Potsdam Conference. From aboard the USS Augusta, he announced that the United States had a new weapon that could end the war. Meanwhile on Guam, the crew of the Enola Gay was forced to wait for clear skies before proceeding to Hiroshima. Captain McVeigh's group was not found until 10 a.m. the following morning by the destroyer USS Ringness. They had drifted 116 miles since the ship sank. When his identity was verified, McVeigh was placed into a private cabin, and he volunteered to talk about what happened to Captain Meyer of the Ringness. Once he finished his interview, Meyer composed a dispatch to sink back at Pearl Harbor, which included the words, not zigzagging. McVeigh physically cringed at the wording, but in his heart knew it was the right thing to do, since sooner or later the truth would come out. By the afternoon of the 3rd, Naval Command released a new order reading, Until further notice, all ships with 500 or more total on board shall be provided with an escort between Ulithi and Lady, regardless of speed, and a second which read, All combatant ships five hours overdue shall be reported to originator. The final survivors rescued that afternoon were those of Marine Private McCoy's group. Their inflatable raft had been so badly deflated that they were floating up to their chins when they were found. 
of the original 1,196 men of the Indianapolis, only 321 survived the torpedoing and subsequent four days, four of which succumbed to their injuries. 67 of the ship's 81 officers were lost, as were 808 of her enlisted crew. Of the 900 casualties, 200 were due to shark attacks, averaging 50 a day. On Saturday, August the 4th, recon ships began retrieving and identifying the bodies. It was nearly impossible to fingerprint them as most were missing hands and others had the skin peeled off. In the minutes before the ring nest docked at Peleliu, Captain McVeigh thanked its crew on behalf of the men of the Indianapolis with a shaking voice. On Sunday, August the 5th, a press conference was held on Peleliu. The stories written by the reporters that day were subject to wartime censor protocols. As a result, there was a news blackout on the island, and so word of the sinking wouldn't be known to the wider world until days later. One reporter asked Captain McVeigh, what would be the normal time before you would be reported overdue? To which McVeigh shot back, that is a question I would like to ask someone. A ship that size practically runs on a train schedule. I should think that by noon, that is to say noon of Tuesday, they would have started to call by radio to find out where we were, or if something was wrong. This is something I would like to ask somebody myself. Why didn't this get out sooner? Ever a loyal Navy man, this was as close as McVeigh would ever come to allowing himself to publicly condemn the Navy. Some of the men recovered quickly from their injuries, while others suffered from the effects of saltwater ulcers and broken limbs. One man's ears were described by medical personnel as having been fried to the texture of cornflakes. All of the men received Purple Hearts, personally pinned to their hospital pajamas by Admiral Spruance, who even stuck around to play a few hands of hearts with some of the boys. It was around this time that James Nolan, the radiologist who had attempted to pass himself off as an Army Ordnance Officer, introduced himself for who he really was to Captain McVeigh. It was only then that the captain understood what the secret cargo had been that put him and his men in harm's way. At 8.15 a.m. on August the 6th, 1945, Little Boy detonated over Hiroshima. I've read three different versions of the message written on the side, but the spirit of what was written there was the same in each one. This one is for the boys of the Indianapolis. At least 70,000 of the city's 345,000 were killed outright, and another 22,000 would be dead before the year's end from radiation poisoning. By Wednesday, August the 8th, the surviving crew of the Indianapolis would all be reunited on Guam. On Thursday, August the 9th, Fat Man fell on Nagasaki, killing 40,000 and wounding another 60,000. Days later, Emperor Hirohito became the first Japanese emperor to address the common people when he announced Japan's unconditional surrender, citing America's new and most cruel bomb. The same day Fat Man fell, Admiral Nimitz ordered a court of inquiry into the sinking of the Indianapolis, and he requested that it be completed in less than a week. The inquiry would investigate the cause of the disaster, the reasons for the rescue delay, and determine what culpability, if any, existed amongst the players. This was pro forma in the aftermath of any possible violation of military law. But amazingly, one of the judges sitting at the inquiry would be Vice Admiral Murray, commander of the Marianas in Guam. It was under Murray's command that Captain Oliver Naquin had given McVeigh the incomplete intelligence report concerning enemy submarine activity along the Petty Route. At 8 p.m. on August the 14th, President Truman announced the end of World War II from the Rose Garden. In the 12 days after the rescue, virtually no one, aside from those who had direct contact with the survivors, knew of the disaster. Minutes before Truman's announcement, the White House released a short bulletin reading, The USS Indianapolis has been lost in the Philippine Sea as a result of enemy action. The next of kin of the casualties have been notified. Some of the next of kin first found out as they tuned in to hear Truman's speech. Most families were given MIA notifications before later being corrected. On August 15th, military censors were finally lifted, and soon after, newspapers across the nation were writing of the debacle. The article the New York Times published referred to it as one of the darkest pages of our naval history. 
However, these stories were pretty much buried to the back page, because all the lead stories were about the victory in Japan and the VJ Day celebrations. On August 13th, the Court of Inquiry began proceedings at the headquarters on Guam. Private McCoy had, since his recovery, become Captain McVeigh's personal driver. Shortly before the inquiry, McVeigh told McCoy that he thought that the Navy was going to pin the whole thing on him, and that they were going to use not zigzagging as their excuse. On August the 20th, after hearing testimony from 43 witnesses, including Oliver Naquin, who called the danger of enemy submarine attack practically negligible, the inquiry closed. Among other things, the inquiry found that the port director of Lady's failure to report the Indianapolis' non-arrival was regrettable, but understandable given the ambiguous nature of Directive 10CL45. The inquiry laid the blame for the sinking on two things. Failure to zigzag, and McVeigh's failure to send out a distress message. When questioned, McVeigh stated that he doubted that a distress message had ever gotten off. And despite the testimony of radio man Jack Miner, who was in the radio room as the SOSs were being sent off, the inquiry decided to believe McVeigh. Blame was also laid at the feet of Rear Admiral McCormick's staff for their incorrect decoding of the message notifying him of the Indianapolis's impending arrival at Lady and for Lieutenant Gibson for failing to report the Indianapolis missing her ETA. The inquiry recommended disciplinary action for McCormick's staff, a letter of admonition for Gibson, and a court-martial for McVeigh. Essentially, this passed the ball on to Naval Secretary James Forrester to decide what legal action would proceed. After a month of recovery, the survivors of the Indianapolis returned home via San Diego where they were met by a small homecoming parade sponsored by the Salvation Army. Few of the survivors took part in the festivities. The men were given leave ranging between two to four weeks, which most spent returning home to see their families, but many of the men still had as much as two years left on their naval contract. For his part, Captain McVeigh flew home to Washington, D.C., and began to compose letters to bereaved families. He was obviously consumed with guilt and felt that his punishment would last the rest of his life. Just a couple of months later, on November 29th, he learned that he was going to be court-martialed, with a trial starting on December the 3rd. This left him with less than five days to prepare a defense. Admirals Nimitz and Spruance disagreed with the inquiry's findings, and had recommended a letter of reprimand rather than a court-martial. However, the Chief of Naval Operations, Admiral King, was a by-the-book man. When he ordered the court-martial to go ahead, Naval JAG hadn't even finalized charges, and didn't think that a trial was necessary as McVeigh had already admitted to not zigzagging. JAG concluded that they couldn't prove the ship hadn't sent off a distress signal, both because of the testimony of Jack Miner as well as the previously mentioned radio men who had received the distress signal. So instead, they made up a second charge, failure to abandon ship in a timely manner. This was problematic because of how quick the Indy went down, but without a second charge, there would be no trial. It was by this careful choice of charges that the Navy's conduct would not be on trial. The question of why 900 men were left afloat for five days wasn't going to be considered. As the trial began, the American public began to sense McVeigh was getting a raw deal. Time magazine wrote that the sinking represented a colossal blunder for the Navy. And again, McVeigh was the first captain in United States history to be tried for losing a ship as a result of enemy action. When the trial began, Dr. Haynes was called as a witness. He denied Jag's charge of the lighting being good on the evening of July 30th. He noted that visibility was very poor as it was a cloudy night with only a crescent moon in the sky. Now, it was unknown to McVeigh, or his lawyer, that the ultra-intelligence had been withheld from them. The ultra-program was still considered so top-secret that even the presiding judges didn't have clearance to read it. 
Now, things really heated up on the second week of the trial when the Navy made the bizarre decision to fly in Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto from Japan to testify. Needless to say, Washington and the newspapers went absolutely berserk, with congressional representatives like Edith Rogers describing Hashimoto's presence as an outrage against justice. Increasingly, it became clear to everyone that the Navy was trying to pin its own failings on one officer. Hashimoto confirmed that the Indianapolis was not zigzagging that night, but he also said that it wouldn't have made a difference, as he would have used the same firing method regardless. Days later, a highly decorated submarine commander also said that zigzagging is of negligible value. Despite this, on December 19th, Captain McVeigh was convicted of hazarding his ship by failing to zigzag. He was demoted 100 points in rank permanently, and another 100 temporarily, meaning that he would never reach the rank of Admiral as his father had. For what it's worth, Admirals King and Nimitz recommended that his sentence be remitted. But McVeigh wasn't the only one punished. Four other officers, including Commodore Gillette and other staff in the Philippines, received letters of reprimand, though these letters were later withdrawn. McVeigh took his sentence stoically, knowing that he would never command another ship. He left Washington, D.C. three months later, when he was reassigned to a naval air station in New Orleans to take up a desk job. Most of the Indianapolis's survivors had lifelong nightmares, some of water, others of sharks, and of course most of them had triggers that would bring memories of the disaster flooding back. As I think I mentioned before, Dr. Haynes would break down and weep every time he heard the Lord's Prayer recited. But some of the men wanted to remember what they had survived. Private McCoy was the first one to put together a reunion 15 years later in a downtown hotel in Indianapolis. He wrote to every one of the 317 survivors, and though not more than a few of them were upset that he wanted to bring these memories back up, 220 of them made the trip. McVeigh himself made an appearance and was lauded. As his plane arrived at the airfield, his former crewmen lined the airfield and saluted him when his plane landed, and many of them spent the evening shaking his hand and apologizing for how the Navy had treated him. Captain McVeigh eventually retired after 30 years of service and went on to sell insurance. In the last few years of his life, he began to spiral into despair. In 1961, his beloved wife died of cancer, and he impulsively married a high school flame. Four years later, his grandson died of a sudden illness. He spent what was left of his time puttering around his farm, playing bridge, and working in his workshop. But every year, it became more and more difficult for him to read the letters. Since his conviction, the families of the dead began to send him letters on every Christmas, on every birthday, and on every anniversary after the sinking. Most of the letters began to arrive around early December. Christmas cards that had messages like the one that reads, Merry Christmas! Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't killed my son. His wife Vivian did her best to intercept these, but the ones that she missed would be bundled together and go into the top drawer of McVeigh's dresser. Finally, in November of 1968, Unable to face another Christmas, he shot himself. The final victim of the Indianapolis had died. He was given a 21-gun salute in Arlington, and his ashes were scattered over the Bay of New Orleans, where he had spent the happiest years of his life. But that is not the end of the story. The survivors never forgot their beloved captain and the way in which the Navy treated him as a scapegoat. In 1996, some of the survivors requested a new investigation into the ship's sinking, but Naval Jag said his conviction was legally sound. Enter Hunter Scott. As I stated in the previous episode, Scott's interest in the Indianapolis came from Captain Quint's monologue in Jaws. When he went to his school library to get more information about the sinking, he was surprised to discover that none of the books mentioned it anywhere. Frustrated, He put out an ad in the local Navy paper, as Pensacola was and still is a Navy town, and asked if anyone had contact with the survivor from the ship. Shortly thereafter, he was put in touch with one from Huntsville who happened to have a list of the 150-odd men still alive. From there, he sent each of them questionnaires 
and read as many declassified documents as he could get his hands on and crafted one incredible history project. But the project lived on beyond that competition, and it generated so much interest from the public that it was brought to the attention of a congressman. Seizing on this interest, Scott got in touch with news crews that would accompany him to different representatives' offices, where he would lay out Captain McVeigh's case and ask if he could have their support in Washington. This tactic worked quite well, leading Scott, along with several other survivors, to testify before the Senate Armed Services Committee. In the year 2000, Congress passed an amendment that was later ratified by President Clinton, which exonerated McVeigh and recommended a unit citation for the ship's survivors. Lieutenant Commander Hashimoto, who at this point in his life had become a Shinto priest, was reportedly very pleased to hear this news. The Navy, however, was stubborn and refused to strike McVeigh's conviction from his naval record. However, the following year, after books like Stanton's and Harm's Way, as well as a book by Scott about his experiences researching the disaster, Naval Secretary Gordon England made the surprise announcement that McVeigh's court-martial would be reversed. He stated that the following amendment would be made to McVeigh's record. Quote, The American people should now recognize Captain McVeigh's lack of culpability in the tragic loss of the USS Indianapolis and the lives of the men who died as a result of the sinking of that vessel. Captain McVeigh's military record should now reflect that he is exonerated for the loss of the USS Indianapolis and so many of her crew. At long last, the men of the Indianapolis were given the legacy they deserved. Well, ladies and gentlemen, despite the nearly two and a half hour runtime of this series, I think it's worth noting that there are many aspects of the story that we just couldn't give justice to. We've been sharing documents, articles, and other stories on our social media pages, but I'd encourage you to check out other sources, and particularly first-hand accounts, to get a real sense of scale of what really happened back in 1945. If there's anything you think we missed, or something that we should have covered in greater detail, please reach out to us on our website or social media pages. Because Michael and I are putting together a follow-up bonus episode of this series that comes out on all of our regular podcast platforms October the 6th. It will be more of an informal discussion on the various topics we felt needed greater clarification, as well as a behind-the-scenes look at the process of bringing this story to you, since we actually only began this project just a little over two months ago. In terms of what's coming next for Grizzly History, we are going to be taking a short break as we prepare for our next series of episodes. We'll have our bonus episode for you out in just a few weeks, as well as bonus content across our social media channels. But the next full-length episode will be coming out November the 3rd. A little longer than usual between episodes, but we promise, this one is going to be worth the wait. Be sure to stick around to the very end of this episode, and we might have a little something special prepared to announce the topic of the upcoming series. As always, if you've enjoyed what you've heard thus far, please consider following the show wherever you get your podcast, interacting with our social media channels, and leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Remember, your early support now is helping us to shape Grizzly History into what it's going to become. Grizzly History is a podcast hosted by myself, Graham Parker, and produced by Michael Ruiz. For more information on the show, as well as links to our various platforms, please visit our website, grizzlyhistory.com. Finally, if you are working on a project that requires voiceover talent, I am available and I'd love to get in touch with you. Please reach out to my email address, graham at grizzlyhistory.com, and I'd be happy to talk to you about your upcoming project. Again, that is graham, G-R-A-H-A-M, at grizzlyhistory.com. When we think of exploration, we think in terms of east and west. We think of Vespucci, Columbus, Cortez. We think of conquerors and explorers, asylum seekers, prisoners and invaders, the trade of fur, the trade of slaves, and everything fascinating and villainous alike. But centuries after the known world stretched entirely across the globe, there were still places yet to be discovered, claimed, and conquered. Two directions that no one had ever seen the end of. North and South. 
at the poles, both Arctic and Antarctic, what could be found? Were there new species, wildlife and fauna? Perhaps there were fossils to give us a glimpse of what our world used to be. Or more importantly than many, were there new trade routes to be discovered? Or new lands to call their own? Earth's final frontiers had yet to be mapped, explored, and exploited. So who would be first? Who would conquer the ends of the Earth?